afternoon, everybody. I'd like to begin by thanking the Cooper Awards Committee for having selected me to be the 2020 Cooper Lecturer. This is indeed a great honor and very meaningful to me because Al Cooper has affected uh, my academic uh, progress and career choices at a very early stage. I was a graduate student at Clausdale University of Technology at the time. And since Al had uh, done such contribution to the field of uh, interdiffusion in complicated uh, multi-component uh, oxide melts, uh, and this happened to be my uh, thesis project, uh, obviously I had his papers in that pile of uh, papers that I kept on my desk. But my first encounter with Al uh, went back a little bit before that. Um, as an experimentalist, I kept good relationship with the machine shop people, so I went there to visit on occasion. And I noticed this picture on the wall, nicely framed, of a guy uh, with a beard, in a lumberjack shirt, arms rolled up, um, and he looked very determined and very confident. And so I asked who that might be. So the person in the picture in the machine shop was Al Cooper, who was visiting Clausewitz University of Technology as a visiting professor in 1973. The actual picture doesn't exist anymore, but this is the closest I could find that looks like him in that, like in that picture. This is the same year at a conference in Leipzig, standing in the back asking a question. Here's another picture of Al when he was at Case Western Reserve University later. And I also like to share this quote uh, that Al Cooper at the beginning of his career was uh, likened to a bright light in an otherwise dismal season. Uh, the actual author was not, is not known, but it was quoted by uh, Bill Prindle. So let me get to the actual technical talk. Uh, it's entitled Exploring the Amorphous State of Matter by Roaming About the Network Building Blocks. And I will first acknowledge my co-workers. Uh, Wei Min Wang was a former student in my group who did many of the experiments and uh, analyses. Vazik Hashishin and Kamen Bega are current students. Vazik is doing experiments and Kamen is doing uh, molecular simulations. And Rafat Mohammadi was a visiting professor from Iran who worked uh, with us for six months. I also would like to acknowledge uh, my collaborators, uh, Steve W. Martin from Iowa State University, who is a close collaborator on, on this issue. Uh, Corning Incorporated produced the sodium borosilicate glasses, and Steve Feller and his co workers at Coe College produced and characterized the sodium borate germinate glasses. And I'd like to acknowledge the funding source, uh, National Science Foundation of the United States. The outline is that we'll talk about these mixed network former glasses. They're sodium borosilicates and bor germinates. Um, both series have 20% of sodium oxide, and then there's an exchange between uh, the uh, two network former elements in each one of these groups. Important here, is that we look at elastic properties juxtaposed to uh, ion conductivity. And that gives us information about the short range order. It also <coughs> shows that there's a strong correlation between conductivity and mechanical properties. And this led to an improved transition state theory model. Um, and currently we are trying to improve that by doing molecular simulations on the same uh, systems. Among the different characterization techniques that we use in this project, Perhaps the least best known are the inelastic light scattering techniques, in particular brilliant light scattering that we use in order to measure the adiabatic moduli of the glass samples. So I'd like to just spend a few minutes uh, talking about this technique. Um, so here's a, a view of our optical table. We have a Raman spectrometer in the back. We have a brilliant spectrometer over here. Uh, and then various sample stages uh, uh, around the table. The light is being generated by the laser back here, uh, conducted around the table, then when it hits the sample, here's like a, just a generic open sample stage. Uh, it scatters in all directions, but it's collected in a particular way, in a particular direction, and then part of the light is being guided into the Raman spectrometer, and part of the light is being guided into the Brillouin spectrometer. So we can, uh, in essence, do a simultaneous Brillouin and Raman uh, light scattering measurement, whereas Raman gives us information about the chemistry and, and local structure of the material, and Berlin gives us uh, information about the nanoscale uh, mechanical properties. And here's uh, just a slide on how uh, to understand Berlin light scattering. So light scatters off of um, elastic waves, sound waves as you like, or phonons, uh, 
Um, and a, a depiction of that is, is shown here, uh, density maxima where the, the particles are uh, close to each other and minima in between. Uh, light comes in a particular way, in a, a given direction that's designed on the outside. Um, and then we set up the collection optic such that we have a scattering angle um, and we collect the light in that direction. So we have the two directions defined and given a diffraction condition by this train of density maxima and minima, um, we can identify exactly which direction uh, the sound propagates. Now the distance between the minimum and the maximum, or the, the, sorry, two minima in, in this uh, is about 100 nanometers. Um, and that's the equivalent of a dog bone sample that you would uh, consider in a, in a uh, tensile testing experiment. What you get out is uh, a typical spectrum on the uh, right here. The distance between the central peak, which is the Raleigh peak, and either of these Berlin peaks, uh, anti-Stokes and Stokes, um, that distance in frequency gives us a measure of the velocity of sound. And once you know that and you know the density of the material, then you can calculate the um, elastic uh, moduli. Imagine now that you're holding that 100 nanometer dog bone sample up to look at. You would be able to see the molecular structure with your naked eye. That means that brilliant light scattering uh, gives us some information about the topology of the network in a sense of how it uh, provides the connectivity and therefore the stiffness the same way as the modification here would disrupt the network and therefore lower uh, the elastic modulus. However, in order to describe conductivity in the system, we also need to know uh, the concentration of these sites, the distance between them, uh, and possibly the local environment that the ions that migrate through the structure would encounter. And that's something that NMR spectroscopy is very good at. So the information that we gain from NMR spectroscopy uh, reveals these particular structural units that exist in the network. So either uh, these cations are bonded to other cations uh, fully or they're somewhat uh, under-coordinated or over-coordinated. So we have a nomenclature that um, we adopted from NMR spectroscopy. Um, the number two here in parentheses refers to the number of bridging oxygens that are belonging to this uh, particular boron. That means two of these um, belong only half to that particular boron, so that's why there's two over two here. And then the other one, uh, belongs fully to this boron, so that's there, the plus one that, uh, that appears in this expression. Um, this boron is over-coordinated, um, has um, therefore a charge associated with it, and it can act as a site for um, a sodium to locate at, the same way as the non-bridging oxygen has a charge, and that would provide a site for, for sodium. And then for silicon, we expect that there be a three um, a coordinate system with bridging oxygens and a four, which is a fully coordinated one, for germanium, we expect something that's under-coordinate, something that's regularly coordinate, and we have an over-coordinate uh, species that um, <clears throat> has, again, a charge associated that occurs in the octahedral form and uh, can, again, act as a, a site for uh, sodium to be located at. Depending on whether you have a lot of disruption, like non-bridging oxygens, or whether you have a fully coordinate network, uh, or even over-coordinate, you would expect a difference in elastic moduli. The other thing that we can establish is using thermodynamics, since uh, we are mixing basically uh, sodium oxide and silicon dioxide. There's going to be a, dis uh, an, a, a modification reaction that takes place, where <clears throat> one bridging oxygen is exchanged for two non-bridging oxygens. And you can write an equation for that, a reaction equation, and for that you would have an equilibrium constant. Uh, never mind what that value is, that's something that we'll discuss later. Um, in ternary systems now, we have a displacement where you have, say, a regularly coordinate silicon uh, cation and you have an over-coordinate boron, and that may not be the, the happiest one, so it displaces this one into an under-coordinate silicon and therefore becomes a regularly coordinate um, boron, um, and, a, and in a similar way of, also for germanium. Here you can write the equilibrium constants in such a way that you just use the law of mass action for um, uh, ideal solutions and <clears throat> find that you actually can use the ratio of the equilibrium constants for binary systems to describe that uh, of the ternary system. Boron 11 magic angle spinning NMR spectroscopy is a safe way to get information about the boron species in these systems. This is what we used for all the compositions that we investigated. 
And so we get um, the concentration as a function of the mole fraction of the borate uh, concentration out. Um, and this is boron 3, this is boron 4. And then if we add to this our thermodynamic equation, uh, then we can, um, by replacing some of these unknowns in this in this uh, ra ratio with the stoichiometric balances from the equations, from the reaction equations, we can regroup this into a polynomial of the second degree, solve for the roots, and the positive root gives us the concentration of silicon-3 in this case. And then with um, the balance equations for the fact that the total boron has to add up, the total silicon has to add up, and then uh, the charge balance has to also match so that the total uh, charge should, should cancel, um, we can uh, calculate everything um, that we need to know for the bor borosilicate systems. For the details, I refer to you, uh, you to this uh, publication by Wang et al. from 2017. But let's take a look at the um, uh, germinate system. Uh, again, uh, boron 3 and boron 4 have been measured, and with the balance equations of all borons, we get uh, those three species out. We then add our thermodynamic equation or our chemical reaction equation and uh, with the same procedure get a polynomial second degree of, of uh, germanium-3 in this case uh, that we can solve for the roots. What uh, we have pr uh, problems with is even with um, um, this equation here, the, the equilibrium constant has a product of two of the unknowns in there and so uh, despite the fact that we have these balance equations, so we have uh, one, two, three, four uh, total equations. Um, but um, when we, we measure two, that means for six unknowns, which are all, all these species, uh, we have enough equations except that uh, one of the factors in there is, is unknown. So we have to resort to a different approach to find that particular um, reaction constant. And the way that we did this is based on the following observation. Recall that the elastic modulus tells us something about the bonding topology in the network. So the more bonds there are, the, the stiffer it is. In particular, if you want to have a good resistance to the shear deformation, uh, you need bonding that goes out of plane. That means you have a three-dimensional connectivity that's necessary from each point. And so we plotted the uh, longitudinal modulus, which contains both the shear and uh, bulk modulus, as a function of the composition here expressed in terms of number density, and we get these blue dots, and this is for the sodium borosilicate system, NBS. Um, and then we compare to that the density, the, the density, number density again of uh, the species that are highly coordinated in the network. That means both uh, silicon-4 and boron-4. And you see that those are the, the white data points they're tracking uh, each other pretty well, and you can also establish the correlation. You can then write a linear correlation between those as a, as a function that has some numbers here. And this uh, density of uh, tetrahedrally coordinated st uh, structural units um, and, and, uh, reflects um, the quantity of these, in, in these units. And so we apply that now also for, uh, to uh, the board germinates. Uh, and what we have to do is um, we, we find a similar um, correlation. So there's not just like, um, I mean, it's not perfect, but you st still have a decent correlation. You have, in the end, um, again, a linear relationship that has a high correlation coefficient in it. And in this case, we have boron-4, uh, germanium-4, and germanium-6 as the highly coordinate um, uh, species that would contribute to the elastic modulus that involves shear deformation, so the, the longitudinal modules. Now what we had to do though before we got this plot is, is uh, go back to our equations and what we did is uh, we uh, had to um, write this equation, solve it. The other are relatively simple uh, to solve but we had to make an assumption uh, for, <clears throat> for K in here. So we make an assumption for K we get the concentration of germanium uh, 3 then we can get the rest of the uh, um, uh, species of germanium and then compare um, those uh, species with a density in this plot, so that means that we add them all up, uh, all um, these two here and, and with the boron, and then compare that with uh, uh, the correlation with the elastic modulus, the longitudinal modulus, and we um, got uh, the result for um, the concentrations of uh, both germanium-4 and germanium-6 for the best fit uh, when the function of this highly coordinate density of uh, structural units uh, becomes the best linear fit in, in this approach.
So to our knowledge, this is the first time that nanomechanical properties have been used to directly calculate the concentration of structural species in an amorphous material. With that, we have now established all the information that we need um, to go on and, and discuss uh, transport properties in the same glassy systems. So transport properties. The first thing we did is m measure the dielectric uh, impedance of all these glasses. And since sodium is about the only species that migrates anywhere, uh, that gives us the ionic connectivity of uh, the network modifier species. And so we plot this as a function, uh, the negative logarithm of this connectivity as a function of the number density, and uh, keep in mind that um, this is a negative, an inverted scale. Um, then we remember that uh, we also have elastic modulus data, and so we superimposed different kinds and found that the best correlation between the negative logarithm of the ionic connectivity and elastic properties in case of the bulk modulus. And <clears throat> uh, you have a very strong correlation between the two. That means we can uh, establish a relationship where we plot the negative, or we, we say the negative logarithm of uh, sigma is equal to a linear relationship of uh, the bulk modulus. So we have a scaling factor and a shifting factor, just to make these two quantities be on the same um, scale, essentially. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we also know that we have um, the Arrhenius behavior that, that's known for describing the activated uh, jump. And so if you write that out and, and compare the left-hand sides, then we uh, come to the conclusion that it looks like the activation energy here um, is proportional to the bulk modulus. And with that then, um, and it's not so, too uh, surprising because the bulk modulus represents an energy per unit volume, whereas the uh, activation energy represents an energy per ion. And so with that then, we go to the scenario that was described by Anderson and Stewart, and uh, they divided up the total activation energy into a Coulomb contribution and an elastic uh, strain energy. And so the way that that comes about is if you consider the locations uh, for the ions where they are stable, they're typically surrounded by a negatively charged species, um, and then they jump to another uh, location where they are surrounded by negatively charged species. So the Coulomb contribution to this um, describes dislodging from this highly stable, ener energetically highly stable uh, condition to another one. So it becomes, uh, there's a higher energy in between, and that's being added up, uh, that that's, uh, um, uh, amounts to the uh, Coulomb contribution to, uh, of this uh, process. So in the next mixed network form of glasses, uh, the negatively charged environments are either the non-bridging oxygens or the negatively charged oxygens uh, that belong to an overcoordinate network species. And so we can count out all the possible scenarios of coordination of the sodium ion and then set them up into pairs um, and look at the combinations of these pairs. So here we have, for example, uh, two non-bridging oxygens and two non-bridging oxygens on, on either side of the, uh, the departure and the ending side. Uh, we have uh, bridging oxygen. In this case, we have uh, a mixture of non-bridging oxygens here and bridging oxygen at the end state. Um, and so we can calculate, uh, for each one of these, we would calculate the, um, uh, the energy that, that's involved. Um, and <clears throat> uh, looking at the uh, energy at the transition state, so halfway in between uh, the two sites and, and then the ones in the ground state, and we get the energy here as a function of number density, and they're very closely linearly correlated. Um, that is not a surprise because the more compact the structure is, the, the lower uh, the energy is at the, the bonded side or the equilibrium side, and therefore overcoming that, dislodging from that, re requires a, a higher activation barrier. Now, the important thing to note is that um, the total amount of uh, the Coulomb energy to the total activation energy, the measured one, is only 6%. This means that the other 94% of this activation energy belong to the strain deformation. And so here we write uh, the equation from Landau and Lifshitz about uh, of the strain energy, um, which involves uh, the two Lamé constants, lambda and mu. And then these strains here are the sum over all diagonal terms, and these are the double sums of all the off-diagonal terms. We can rewrite this, uh, subtracting u0 from both sides, um, and then get uh, this term lambda plus 2 thirds times mu, which ends up being the same as the bulk modulus. Um, 
Then mu itself is the shear modulus. The effective strains in the diagonal will be isotropic deformations, and these will be all the shear deformations. Uh, we lump into a factor lump, uh, omega k and omega g, uh, re re referencing the effective strain deformation. We don't know what that is exactly, but we have an, an estimate which comes from the, the Bywaller factor. It means that the average thermal um, vibrational amplitude of Abens uh, um, educates us uh, on how much strain we can expect. So we uh, we group this and get for the activation energy the strain part of it. Um, this term of uh, this volume of Vs of A, which now has to multiply omega to become a um, uh, an energy, um, or sorry, uh, times K will be an energy. Um, so we need to multiply this um, uh, with a volume, both the uh, strain um, uh, for isotropic deformation and the strain for shear, de shear deformation. Um, and get this factor uh, and call this volume the affected volume. It means that these are all the particles that have to cooperate when the cation jumps. That means they have to exercise a, um, a choreographed dance, move out of, out of the way in order for the cation to be able to pass. So that's the volume encompassing those atoms. Um, and we lump this into a factor capital Phi um, by multiplying out omega. And then saying that part of it is uh, uh, isotropic deformation and the rest of it is shear deformation. So psi is a, a factor that varies between 1 and uh, 0 and 1. Uh, and it's either all uh, isotropic or all shear strain or somewhere in between. With this now, we are able to go back to the equation that we have seen earlier, which was that the activation energy is uh, proportional to the bulk modulus. Uh, we expand this to some extent. Uh, by allowing that it's not just the bulk modulus, but it could also be the shear modulus, or some partition between the two. So this expression now is being rewritten uh, into the expression on the right, and we have, like, this might be the B prime, um, <clears throat> but then we have the A prime is some kind of a factor of um, uh, Xi and, and capital Phi. And what we do now is we take, um, we do a double fit, a simultaneous fit of two data sets. One of them is... Um, the activation or sorry the, the measured activation energy using this expression but at the same time uh, we have the unknown factors psi and also the um, affected volume in here and we require that uh, those would be a continuous uh, function that means that uh, the data would not erratically vary and so by uh, making that constraint, we are able to fit two sets of data. You see the um, affected volume word, this factor capital Phi, uh, is down here, and then the activation energy is up there for both uh, the uh, silicates and the germinates. We get a decent fit, and so these two fits are interdependent. Um, we made the assumption that we could allow for shear deformation, and that means that if Xi uh, will be um, small, um, then um, there would be sufficient or significant shear deformation in that coordinated or... Um, but we <coughs> find that uh, Xi is 0 0.9 or 1 um, in either case. So it's pretty much uh, almost entirely uh, a bulk deformation, which makes sense because it's more like uh, if you want to uh, allow for uh, particles to pass, you have to make way for it. You have to open up the gateway, and uh, so it's more like a breathing mode that we are, uh, should be expecting. Um, in this slide, I'm summarizing the data. Uh, so the bulk modulus, the activation energy is essentially uh, the vertical axis upwards is equal to the connectivity or proportional to connectivity um, <clears throat> or the logarithm of the connectivity. And what's interesting or important down here is uh, the, the number of affected uh, atoms that are participating in, um, in this uh, activated process. So uh, to just put in perspective, um, activation energies are typically of the order of, uh, well, there they go, somewhere between uh, 0 0.8 and 0 0.7 um, electron volts per atom. That would mean that uh, we would have like somewhere around 6,000 Kelvin uh, would be concentrated on one particular atom if that was the only one that, uh, this, the only atom that was affected by this process. So that would be the cation. Um, it would lose its electrons, so it's not very likely. Instead, we have a more likely scenario that the energy is distributed over a number of atoms surrounding that cation, and so we find from our analysis that that is about 25, roughly, 
um, <coughs> a little bit uh, plus or minus a, a few, uh, which corresponds to about two coordination shells. So the nearest oxygens and uh, the, the, the cations that are from the network that are uh, attached to that. So the interpretation of, of this, and I'll let you uh, read perhaps the, the reference, Wang et al. from uh, 2018, down here in order to get uh, like the detailed explanation, but I'll give you the upshot here, which is that assume that, well, one of the things that we have to accomplish is, um, or that the system has to accomplish is that it needs to focus phonon energy onto roughly two dozen atoms. Um, and that would mean that you kind of concentrate this in a certain region in a wave space, um, and the higher this number, the smaller the areas that's affected. Right? So you would just shift the Gaussian uh, to the left, sorry, to the right, in order to get a smaller area, or to the to the left if if you want to have a, a larger volume that's participating. And as soon as you do that, if you go to the right, no matter whether you have a compliant network or a stiff network, the activation energy goes up. So the frequency that's required, uh, or the energy that that's being um, focused on here, is proportional to this lump here, and, and so it just goes up just by following this dispersion relationship. So this would be the frequency versus, versus the wave vector. So it always is it advantageous to have a more compliant network and to have the ability to distribute the energy over a larger number of atoms that can participate in that. That means that there's more, also more degrees of freedom for atoms to move around in order to uh, facilitate uh, this uh, particular activated process. But there's only so far we can go with this mean field approach. We made assumptions like that uh, all the atomic jumps uh, have the same distance on average, that the sites where the uh, ions reside are equidistant and randomly and equally distributed, evenly distributed over, over space. We also assumed that um, the um, affected volume does not change radically with composition, but it, it does uh, sort of smoothly and continuously change with composition. But I think we can do better than that, and that's what I'll be talking next about, which is to introduce molecular simulations in order to get uh, more detailed structural information to um, attach to this uh, transition state model. So our simulations are still a work in progress, and I'll give you just the upshot as to how far we've gotten, um, what's involved, um, and what the destination is. Um, I'll also save you the... Uh, details on the molecular simulation methods, except to say that we use a reactive force field so as to not to uh, preconceive the topology of the network. So we hope that uh, the network will form in the simulations uh, rather naturally. Uh, a lot of work goes into generating these realistic structures. But once we have them, we can analyze uh, information that comes from it. Here's like a snapshot of the affected volume. Um, you can see the blue atom in the center is, is the sodium, uh, green is uh, silicon, uh, black is boron, and of course, as always, oxygen is red. Um, and you can gauge what the surrounding is, you can gauge what the gateways are that the ion has to go through, but the information is complex, and so we probably need some statistical analysis tools to uh, make headway. Uh, the standard ones are... Uh, G of R uh, as, as pair correlation functions, and here are all the pairs that, that are of interest. And uh, just to to show, uh, yes, there is uh, like possibly two peaks of uh, nearest sodium sodium distance, so the, the jump distance would be like either one of those two. There's a distinction in that, but they're relatively close, so we probably didn't make that uh, great of a mistake when, when we calculated uh, our statistical measures on the mean field approach. Similar to generating realistic structures using molecular simulations, it can also be challenging to study ion mobility. At high temperatures, it's relatively easy to use a construct like the mean squared displacement to get the diffusion coefficient basically from the slope. Um, you see on this log-log representation of the mean squared displacement, uh, there's a, a slope of 1, uh, meaning that this uh, system has uh, reached the diffusive regime, a Brownian regime. But if you go to lower temperatures, then that line no longer has a slope of 1, and it becomes more difficult to interpret uh, what the slope of that line means. In the, in the first case, the slope means just 6 times the, uh, the diffusion coefficient. Um, and at 
in a glassy state, it's become rather impossible to really discern whether this is stagnation or whether there's still uh, some kind of a drift uh, of, the, of the ion present. But there's another uh, technique, which is the velocity correlation function. Um, it changes also with temperature, but the general um, character of this function is preserved. And so we can use that in order to uh, study the um, mobility, perhaps a little bit better, going from the liquid to the, to the glassy state. And let's take a look at uh, the meaning of the velocity correlation functions. It essentially can be construed as an uh, oscillatory function that's being damped. So you see the damping envelope here. Um, and if you take the integral under this uh, velocity correlation function, <clears throat> anything that is positive is uh, contributing towards the motion of the forward progress of the, of the ion and then with reverts in motion, then it uh, detracts from that, that progress. The Fourier transform of uh, the velocity correlation function, if it's like just a single term, becomes um, a Lorentzian function. And since uh, the Fourier transform is basically this expression here multiplied with e to the i omega t, then uh, the um, diffusion coefficient, which is the area underneath this curve, uh, corresponds to the intercept at zero frequency of um, uh, this Lorentzian. And um, we, for re uh, the realistic uh, velocity correlation functions that we get from simulations, we can, of course, uh, com combine a number of these linearly into uh, a construct that would um, fit that uh, velocity correlation function. This construct of uh, fitting uh, decaying oscillatory function with a linear combination of uh, exponentials that have both a decaying component, which is this relaxation rate here, and an oscillatory component is known as Prony's analysis, and is a, it, it's as old as Fourier's, uh, Fourier transform uh, as well. Um, and so the, the integral of this, of course, then gives you, if you have several terms, gives you also several um, Lorentzians and each of these modes in the, in the Lorentzian. So here's an example of like the, uh, using f five terms in order to fit this um, correlation function. The dashed line is an ex um, simulated one. Um, the total, the sum of these uh, different functions gives you like the red curve here. It's not perfect, especially up in this uh, time regime, but this is just to illustrate it. So you see this, and each one of these modes has an intercept at zero um, that represents the uh, uh, loss of coherence in that motion and that loss of coherence can come about with two for two reasons one of them is phonon collisions that means uh, phonons scatter and give off uh, their energy to another phonon or a diffusive jump that means a particle that oscillates uh, in its equilibrium position suddenly leaves and this is like one in a million or one in a hundred thousand and so it's a, it's a slow damping that that takes place of course if we uh, use enough terms so in this case we have um, uh, a very perfect fit for the velocity correlation function if we use 38 modes. Each mode tells us something about the oscillatory behavior, something about um, the surrounding of the, of the cation. Um, and then we can compare that now. Uh, the Fourier transform is the um, uh, dotted line, the blue line, and the Prony spectrum is uh, the, the light line. Um, and it's almost identical, but there are some systematic deviations from that, so it's not giving us the same exact result. The intercept at zero, <clears throat> which just gives us the overall mobility of the, of the cation, is almost the same. It's off by about the percent. And so the question now is, uh, why do we care about one versus the other? Uh, the Fourier transform just gives us a number, because it, it uh, uses uh, oscillatory modes to cancel the velocity correlation function at high times where it's supposed to have died out. Whereas in the prony analysis, we actually use this uh, damping coefficient, which contains a diffusion, either of uh, a thermal energy or of particles themselves. And so the prony analysis gives us a mechanism, uh, like the number of relevant modes, uh, the relationship to the structural vibrations that surround the cation, and the influence of topology on the, uh, and, and the bonding character of uh, the mobility of atoms in a particular uh, system. And with that, I guess my time is up. So here's my summary. Uh, you can probably read it as I speak. Um, I just want to mention that I'm excited about uh, the results that we have obtained. Uh, for one, uh, 
the uh, uh, adiabatic elastic modulus, which is measured at a frequency scale that's commensurate to that of atomic jumps. So that's an important thing. That means uh, we can we use that modulus in order to describe the stretching of the uh, structure surrounding the ion uh, at the same time scale. Uh, this led to what I would think is an improved uh, uh, transition state model that also reveals the number of atoms that are involved in this process. And then I uh, just gave you a glimpse on um, the techniques that we are pursuing for looking at rare events and uh, getting information about mobility even if there's not that many uh, actual jumps of cations in the simulated systems. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I'll be happy to answer any questions.